that the board might have on the application. Who wants to start? Liza? Well, I guess just to follow up on that question. So that, um, that's a great side view of Thank the retaining wall, the silt, silt fence, or the, sorry, the clay mm -hmm. liner. Mm -hmm. How can we be sure the water's not going to go below that liner and the rocks and then work its way to the adjacent house? Fair, fair question. Maybe I can explain. I thought based on our site walk and based on the discussions about the wall, when we're looking at plan views such as this, I know it's hard for people to understand. And I, I thought for the public hearing and for the presentation, it would make a lot of sense to do a cross section as we discussed because it's easier to talk about the issues and what it would look like. So let me, if, you, if I can uh, just show you what this represents. Uh, this plan is an exaggerated scale, of, uh, so it's not one to one, but some, you know, to give a graphic representation. Uh, this is, for instance, looking south at, at, the, at the lot, in other words, facing on the plan, facing uh, towards the right this way, right in the middle of the lot where the septic system is. And this is the property line here, and the existing grade is something like this. And for the sense of scale, this is about elevation 90, um, and this is that high spot in the middle of the lot, you remember about elevation 96, 97, somewhere in there uh, at, at the high spot. And the proposal on the plan, if you recall, we're going to fill the, the front part of the lot to the road a little bit. This represents a, a, a typical house with the first floor elevation at 101 and a half approximately. Uh, and, and then the lawn behind the house at a gradual slope, so it can be a usable lawn. And you can see the amount, there's several feet of fill over the, the course of the back of the property. And this is that swale that we've talked so much about on top of the wall, was an interceptor swale. This is the swale that would collect the water, pick it up, and discharge it. And, and at this point, the project, I took the point where the wall is at the highest, which is right in the middle of the lot. And this is about four and a half feet uh, overall wall height, somewhere in that range. And what we're talking about is a boulder wall. And then the way the drainage works, the answer to the question is, the lawn and the swale would course be uh, made of, of loam, so, and loam is, is partially impervious. And then below that, what we're suggesting is behind the wall, we typically put a, a gravel fill, a free draining material, and then, and also as a base for the wall, as a standard detail for wall construction. And then we would put a clay barrier behind that as well. So if there's water intercepting the swale and it gets into the wa water, that water doesn't go further uh, behind the wall. And then the, the second thing that we wanted, there was questions about, and I thought I would do this graphically so it, it helps to address questions before they come up. This is the septic system, which would be a three-chambered, the plastic-chambered system. And what it suggests, and, and what this shows, there was the question about, uh, I think one of the butters about, does the septic system effluent have a chance of going through the wall, and does it meet code? First question is no, it does not have a chance of going through the wall. This envelope would be what was required, what would be required under the plumbing code if you just filled the septic system but didn't have any grading going on. And you can see the wall is fully out of the, the fill slope, which is a four to one fill slope beyond the septic system with a three foot extension. If this were just raw land, then everything we're doing is above that slope, it doesn't have any impact on the septic system. Uh, and, and the septic system meets code, so that you don't have the situation of effluent you know, coming out of the wall. And it's just not going to happen because we're above that elevation. So between the, the clay liner and having uh, the, the barrier behind the, the, the wall and having the, the, the loam in place as well, there'd be very little groundwater, surface water, excuse me, that we expect it to infiltrate. Now, what happens with groundwater? Groundwater is always going to seek its own anyway, and so. This won't affect the groundwater per se, other than the fact that water that might have otherwise you know, gone one direction is going in a different. But if there's any groundwater you know, below grade down here, this won't really have any effect on groundwater per se, I wouldn't expect. Does that answer your question? And so, will that, so will that gravel fill retain the water between the clay liner and the wall? The, the gravel fill is actually intended to allow water to weep. And the reason is you don't want to have a wall that has pressure behind it. And, and these walls, the intent here is to build these as dry rock, very, you know, very aesthetic, you know, dry rock walls. These aren't mortared walls where you're building a pressure. So water, the town engineers asked that we put a, a, a footing drain in, at number one, and two, what water naturally does is it naturally just weeps between the rocks anyway, and this acts as an envelope around, around that with a barrier behind it. So any water that does get in behind it 
would we would we bow and not build up this, this pressure? But typically with these kinds of walls, that's not an issue as if you have a concrete wall which is totally impervious, and if you get pressure behind it, you typically see those little relief pipes coming out because that allows water in the in the granular envelope to to weep out. So mm -hmm. I think this would be the time when Mr. Fustachi would like me to circulate his pictures. There's two sets, mm -hmm. same picture, same picture mm -hmm. on that one. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a picture of a similar wall somewhere else? Similar wall in town, and it's a it's, uh, shorter wall. I think that's a couple of feet. So imagine like two, two rocks high, but that's, that's sort of the, the type of wall, very, like a landscape wall, very nice and aesthetic. Uh, not a, uh, again, a mortared, uh, mortared or concrete type of wall. It, um, just a quick question. Sure. In the winter when it, uh, water freezes and expands, so it's going to get in between that and move the wall slightly. How many years, theoretically, would that wall last before it starts to break down? Uh, the I movement would, through the ice and melting and ice. I can't tell you how long, but I can, I, the, the, the philosophy here is, is that the fact that the walls are movable. These are not jointed rocks, number one. They're very heavy rocks. They typically don't, don't move. If they do, that's a good thing because it, it, they'll move with the earth a, a, an inch or a fraction of an inch. And the idea that water, if it's behind it with the granular material, any water would weep out. We're going to be putting a drain in there. It would weep out between the yeah, rocks. You'd have, uh, I mean, the frost line is six foot or something. Mm -hmm. So it's going to, going to, water's going to be in there and it's going to freeze and expand. And it will move the walls slightly. The, not, you wouldn't expect it to move those, those types of walls. It'd be imperceptible. In other words, the wall acts, the wall gives and takes, these walls do, with Mother Nature in a very imperceptible way to take the stress off when you have pressure behind it. But again, typically the wall, the water doesn't build up behind it because it, it weeps out, even in a frozen condition, any water would weep out between the joints and through an underdrain system. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect that to be a big issue. And as opposed to a, a concrete wall where then I think the situation would be different where you... I mean, I went serve. on the sidewalk yeah. and I believe from what I looked at, yeah, the situation yeah. would be better after that wall yeah. was built than before, okay. but I just wondered how long you could expect the wall to last. I would expect it to last a very 30, long 40, time. 30, 100 years? I couldn't tell you, but I think it'd be a very long time. Very long time, yeah. And, and, and point well taken that you know, any wall, any structure, may, time to time may need maintenance chinking and that sort of thing, and that's just the standard with, with anything that you build, but uh, these are pretty low maintenance. Well, right. The clay actually yep. goes some way to stop the yep. it through. The yep. And does the easement agreement clearly state that the owner of Lot 4A is responsible for that maintenance from time to I time? I believe it does. Uh, the, I'd have to, I think it's reciprocal between the lots. Uh, yeah, this is kind of like a domino effect. Um, the easement was given to. Let's see where are we? Four B gave an easement to four A. Four A gave an easement to lot three and the Jamani's on the back property. Mm -hmm. And then it, it also gives them the opportunity to, uh, if the owners of the downstream properties do not maintain it then they have the option to come in and maintain the, uh, the drainage swale. So we feel as though everybody's been protected. But the way the agreements are set up, the primary responsibility for that is on the owner of Lot 4A? It's the pri primary responsibility is the owner of the lot to which the water is draining. So this 4, 4B is responsible for the drainage easement here on their property. 4A would be responsible for the drainage easement in the back of their, their property. And if it's not working properly, then the owner of Mitchell Road can come in and talk with them and, and correct it if the owner of uh, Lot 4A does not correct it. And Lot 3 has that, also, that similar option. If I recall from the site walk, some of the water drains from Lot 3 to the lot immediately behind lot 4A, which I think is the Germani's lot? That's correct. And then to lot 4A. Is that right? Uh, no, I think once it gets on the Germani's property, it, it goes um, down to the uh, sergeant's property. And that was his original concern. And we're giving them the option to drain the water onto lot 4A. Um, 
in the manner he sees fit. Uh, he also indicated that he could drain the water to Mitchell Road through a, um, uh, a swale on his property. But the, we're, correct, we're collecting the water from Lot 3 and channeling it down uh, on Lot 4A and 4B the best we can without going on the Jemani property. Oh, okay. but we, and that's why we gave him an easement. He wasn't willing to allow me to go onto his property and put a, a swale, but we gave him an easement to do, to do that. correct it the way he would like to correct it. He felt that that would affect the saleability of his property. So, and um, there's the town property a little bit further on, and, and then the then town prop goes under the road where that drains away. Correct. Yeah, there's a, the stream, as you probably remember, there's a little stream that comes here and goes to a catch basin, which I installed when we did Blueberry Ridge, and that has the capacity to handle all the water, and it takes it and puts it on to the other side of Mitchell Road. And the angle's down, so it runs down the road, down the wall. Correct. Uh, you yeah, know, without, so that swale will take it down, down to the bottom and to that area where there's a pipe under the road or where... Correct, uh, correct, yep. Okay. Yep. That, that looked to me A technical request, Rick. Um, because all of this drainage relates to surrounding lots and those surrounding lots are referred to in our approvals, I think it would be important that you label on the plan lot three and also label the Germani's lot land now or formerly belonging to the Germanis in some appropriate way um, because all of these really do tie in and on the plan I have in front of me, those <coughs> lots are not labeled. On the, on, the, on the plan that we submitted um, with the easements, it does identify lot three. Unfortunately, it has Norman and Lorraine naming uh, as the uh, Germani property, so we can correct that. Okay, but I'm, I'm saying I'd like to see that not just on the plan that is attached to the easement, but on the subdivision plan itself, that those That's other lots are labeled. The one that will be recorded. Right. 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 Which, yes, will make the change. She wants it on both plans. Yeah, on both plans. Both. So that the surrounding lots are labeled. Not just the plan that's recorded. Okay. The subdivision plan. The site plan as well. That's wrong. That's so, if I may, I, one question. I, the maintenance of the wall, whilst I understand that you say it's semi-permanent um, and shouldn't need any maintenance, if it does, whose responsibility is that and who's actually agreed to maintain that, if anybody? That would go with the, the answer to the question, but that would go within the easement, the, the drainage easement, that wall would go with each lot. So the lot owner of lot 4A would be responsible for the... For the, for the new wall. Right, and the lot owner of 4B would be responsible for any portion on their lot. Any portion of the wall? Of the wall on that lot. The portion of the wall that they're, they're, they've got on their land? Yes, yes. So That would need heavy equipment to move stuff around, right? I mean, can you get can you get that equipment in behind those, those walls? Mm -hmm. I mean, to push them back? That's what the 15-foot easement will accommodate. The equipment to come up through the back of the properties and, and do what it has to do. Okay, all right. right. And that's why it was 15 as opposed to 10. Maureen, have we had our attorney take a look at these easements? I just had a question about the easement deed that was from Mr. Frustacci to Mr. Frustacci and whether that was the appropriate legal instrument because he was giving something to himself. We, I have sent everything to the town attorney and he's provided some comments. Uh, my suggestion, my experience has been that Whenever you send an attorney something, they have comments, and that the applicant's attorney then needs to make adjustments, and it's best to get the two attorneys together to work it out. So okay. my recommendation to the board would be to attach a condition of approval, if you're willing to vote for an approval this evening, that leaves the final language of the easements up to the attorney to approve. Okay, because there's also an amendment to the Declaration of Covenants and Restrictions that seems to me perhaps a more appropriate place to put an easement as opposed to having the grantor and the grantee be the same individual. But I would certainly leave that yeah. to the just, attorneys who are reviewing it. Yeah, just to help you out, that, that easement was given to me as the owner, but also it says to assignees and... and right. I, I understand what you're trying to do. I'm just, I just question whether it's legally effective or if there's a better 
a different way to phrase it that would create the legal effect you're trying to get to? Um, whatever the attorneys agree, right. I'll agree yeah. to.